मानुषी संवाद में आप सबका स्वागत है आज लोहड़ी का त्योहार है उसकी आप सबको शुभकामनाएं शायद आप परिवार के साथ मना ही रहे हो मुझे मालूम नहीं कितने लोग आ, इस प्रोग्राम को अटेंड कर पाएंगे लोहड़ी सेलिब्रेशन की वजह से पर वो काम बहुत जरूरी है परिवार के साथ मिलके आज का दिन ये त्योहार सेलिब्रेट करना लोहड़ी यानी कड़क सर्द ऋतु का अंत और वसंत ऋतु के आगमन की तैयारी पृथ्वी मां शुरू कर देती है कल मकर संक्रांति का त्योहार है यानी इस दिन सूर्य देव मकर राशि में प्रवेश करेंगे और दिन लंबे रातें छोटी होनी शुरू हो जाएगी इस दिन को हिंदुओं में बहुत ही पावन माना जाता है और ये दान पुण्य का दिवस है हमारे अधिकतर त्योहारों में आप देखेंगे देने की दान की प्रथा है ये नहीं कि गिफ्ट लेने की देने का जो महत्व है वो हमारे अधिकतर त्योहार वो ही सिखाते हैं और हमारे सभी त्योहार प्रकृति के उतार चढ़ाव उसकी बदलती ऋतुओं से जुड़े हुए हैं नक्षत्रों के बदलते तालमेल से जुड़े हुए हैं हजारों साल पुराना हमारा सनातन हिंदू कैलेंडर जिसे पंचांग कहा जाता है दुनिया का सबसे पुरातन और सबसे साइंटिफिक कैलेंडर है और इसी कैलेंडर को समझने के लिए उसका महत्व समझने के लिए आज हमारे साथ एक जाने नामी साइंटिस्ट हैं डॉक्टर राज वेदम डॉक्टर राज वेदम वेलकम टू दिस प्रोग्राम रियली ऑनर दैट यू टू हैव टाइम फॉर अस और आपसे बहुत अरसे से मेरा मन था मैं आपको काफी लेक्चर सुने हैं पर थोड़ा देर हो गया आपसे जुड़ा आप करने में पर आई एम सो हैप्पी दैट वी डिड इट ऑन दिस हैप्पी डे एंड वी आर स्टार्टिंग दिस एसोसिएशन ऑन द ऑस्पिशियस डे ऑफ मकर संक्रांति आई ब्रीफली गिव योर योर डिटेल सी बी इज ऑलरेडी ऑन दट यू यू बट आई like to tell the viewers a little bit about you um dosto uh, raj vedam holds a doctoral degree in electrical engineering and has many years of multi disciplinary work experience in diverse industries including power aircraft analog and digital electronic design automation and oil and gas with several journal and conference papers and patents he is an innovator is an innovation leader with strong interest in multiple areas of technology his current professional interests include optimization modeling and machine learning so you can see um, what a wide range of interests he has even in the domain of science but science ko keval ek profession ke roop ne roop mein nahi as a scientist Raj Vedam researches the roots of modern science, mathematics, and technology. Whereas Western narrative favor the origin of astronomy and math, among other fields, as having originated outside India and imported into India during different invasions, Raj Vedam's multidisciplinary studies, using data from several published sources, reveal otherwise. his research proposes an ancient indian civilization that made advances in several fields of knowledge and he believes in evidence based narrative of indian history which is urgently needed to correct the previously distorted identity and history of the indian civilization there's so much to him i don't want to uh, take too much time introducing him we have published his entire cv that he sent us And so please do have a look in the meantime let me invite you dr raj vedam to tell us a the significance of makar sankranti and then go on to tell us why is it that the indian calendar a its antiquity how old it is and why it is the most scientific calendar in the world thank you thank you madhu ji it's a real pleasure to be on your show and it's a privilege also so thank you very much for inviting me to your channel 
uh, again, wish all the readers, uh, viewers, a very happy Makar Shankranti, happy Pongal, happy uh, Lohri, and what, all the celebrations, the various names of the celebration. Let me share my screen. I've got a few slides to show your viewers. So uh, please tell me when you're able to see my uh, slides. I mm -hmm. am just about to share. And please tell me when you can see it. Um, not yet. Yes, it's come. It's come. Wonderful, wonderful. So, okay. So, uh, so, so, uh, I'd like to talk very briefly about the science behind the Hindu calendar. And so, let me start with uh, uh, again saying, talking about Makra Shankranti. It is a pan India festival. And we honor Surya Bhagawan in this festival. And we see rich, very regional variations and celebration. And this is an indicator right here to the deep antiquity of the celebration. And it marks the passage of the sun to the Makara Rashi. It is a solar month and it's marking when does the sun enter the Makara Rashi. And it has been associated to Uttarayana as well as with harvest and so on. So it opens several questions. How old is Makara Shankaranti? Are we celebrating this on the right date? And so to answer this, we need to review calendars and much, much more. So very quickly, let me breeze through this before we have a conversation. So to mark time, it's really a measure of a civilization. And we know that we can mark the time of the day. For example, Panchang helps us. We can use sundials and so on. And uh, time of the year, historically, to understand seasons, when to do agriculture, when to mark uh, festivals, and so on. We need to know what time in the year. Sometimes the age of the individual, how do we mark the years, how old somebody is, could be lunar, solar, and so on. Also, the passage of time, how many years have elapsed since some event, and that's an absolute marker. We're going to see all of these things. What we see is that we, for in India, we see stories that encode astronomical wisdom all the way from stories for the common man to siddhantas for the experienced practitioner we are seeing astronomical wisdom calendars and so on so we'll see calendars show uh, metaphors growth of knowledge measurements modeling and estimation over very vast periods of time so we're going to see mathematical and astronomical knowledge and i'd like to begin by talking about the story of chandra the story of chandra and uh, his wives so it tells us this in Bhagavata Purana, Brahma Vaivarta Purana, Vishnu Purana, talk about the story and says, Chandra married the 27 daughters of King Daksha. And these 27 daughters are a metaphor for the nakshatras, for the 27 nakshatras. And uh, uh, so the question here is, how old can the story be? I'm not going to answer that, but in the course of this talk, it will become apparent. And we are told in the story that Chandra visited a wife every day. And the allegory very clearly is a reference to the sidereal month. A sidereal month is about 27 days. The moon, every day it arises in the eastern horizon at a different time, therefore against a different backdrop of stars or the nakshatra that we have identified. So it takes 27 days approximately to come back to the same nakshatra again. So that is the sidereal month. And we know that in a 24-hour period, the moon traverses 13.3 degrees. Now the story also says... King Daksha was furious because Chandra seemed to favor one of his daughters, that is Rohini, more than the others. And he was very upset with him and he condemned him, saying that you're going to die. And uh, Chandra is very perturbed, so he runs after Mahadeva and says, Mahadeva, I don't want to die. Mahadeva gives him a boon and says, all right, you will experience a life of waxing and waning. So this part of the story is related to the synodic month because it takes the moon about 29 to 30 days to go from Amavasya to Purnami and back to Amavasya. So this is a synodic month. So very clearly, we are seeing in the story an encoding of two entities, the sidereal month and the synodic month. In addition to looking at the moon to mark the passage of time, our ancestors also observed that the sun appears to be doing something strange from our observation point. It appears to be going north and north and north till it reaches the northernmost point. Then it retraces its path and goes south till it reaches the southernmost point. 
So they could estimate this by just looking at the shadows of the sun cast and so on. And they refer to this phenomenon as Uttrayana and Dakshinayana, concept known from Vedic times, mentioned in Surya Siddhanta, Bhagavad Gita, and so on. And we know the six month northward course of the sun, longer days, Uttrayana, and southern course of the sun, we get longer nights, Dakshinayana. There is a story now in Bhagavad Purana and Srimad Bhagavatam that encodes this knowledge. It says Vrika or uh, the Ashura, he got a bone from Rudra that if he places his hand on somebody's head, that person should die. The minute Rudra reluctantly gives him that bone, this Ashura starts chasing Rudra because he wants to see if Rudra will die if he places his hand on Rudra's head. Luckily, uh, Rudra saved a divine maiden who, uh, uh, is, uh, who, who entices this Ashura and starts dancing and Ashura starts dancing with her and she places her hand on her own head. Ashura forgets the bone and he places his hand on his own head and he dies. And it, apparently this death happens on the day of Uttarayana. And we can see that it encodes a lot of metaphors. Vrika is another stand-in for the wolf. And wolf is a nocturnal animal. It hunts at night and sleeps during, during the day. Rudra, another word, Agni, Surya, and so on. So Rutta, Vrika chasing Rudra is an allegory for the uh, sun is running away and the nights are getting longer and longer. And on the day of Uttarayana, when the wolf is killed, then once again, the sun becomes, uh, the sunlight becomes more and more. So this is the story encoded in Uttrayana and Dakshinayana, the solar year. So what we are seeing is that ancient Indians encoded the passage of time through the synodic, the sidereal months, as well as the solar year. And uh, they, they, they made an effort to reconcile these cycles. They could see synodic month is 29.5 days, sidereal month is 27.3 days, how to reconcile those with the observed solar year, that gave rise to many insights and including the Adhika Masa, uh, 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 a certain kind of month, intercalary month inserted so that we can have synchronism between solar and lunar year. And also the intellectual impetus for the great cycles of the yugas. There's a five-year yuga cycle, the 19-year cycle, Samvatsara cycle, all the way to the Chatur Yuga cycle we are seeing various calendrical developments in India by mere observations of what is happening in nature and trying to reconcile and synchronize them. So what are we seeing? Synodic month is marked by the Titi or the phases of the moon. Sidereal could month you, by the Nakshatras. Uh, could, you, could you explain the term synodic? Not everybody may know it. And it would be nice if you just explain what you mean by that. Yes, yes. So, so once once again, the synodic month is referring to the phases of the moon, the tithi, what we call tithi, that every day from Amavasya to Pournami, we have got about 15 days. And from Pournami back to Amavasya, we got about 15 days, totally about 30 days. This is referred to as a synodic month. The sidereal month is every day when the moon arises over the eastern horizon, it is appearing in a different backdrop of stars. That is a nakshatra that we have identified with. And each of these nakshatras, like I said, was given the name of a wife of the moon. So it's like a mnemonic. So uh, uh, it takes the moon about 27 days to finish one complete 360 degree revolution and come back to the same nakshatra. So Indians observed that there's a cycle of the moon that is taking 27 days, the sidereal month. There is another cycle of the moon because of the phases from Amavasya to Pournami back to Amavasya that is taking 30 days. And they also observe Uttarayana and Dakshinayana that is taking about 365.24 days. And all of the intellectual developments I'm going to talk about was based upon understanding how these things can be synchronized so we can mark the passage of time. Synodic month through the estimation of Titi. A lot of calculations to do Titi and understand the phase of the moon. Sidereal month to understand uh, Yogataras, the nakshatra, when the moon appears in a certain nakshatra. Solar year through the understanding of when Uttrayana starts, when Dakshinayana starts, and so on. So we are going to see calendar, yes, celestial... Let me ask a small request, sir, yes. which is, um, could you give the Sanskrit terms for... Uh, for each one of these uh, yes terms. i will i will try i will try so yeah, uh, well, as as much as you can and secondly if you could also explain why it's called panchang yes that's coming it's all coming i have it in my slides we'll talk about it in just a few minutes yeah so so 
the first thing we have to understand is the astronomical model of ancient indians this is a nakshatra and rashi like i said the ecliptic which means the path in which the sun and the moon are going that is divided into 27 segments uh, let me go back to this 27 segments of 13 and 1/3 degrees each and these were given the names of the wives of the moon for example you see here ashwini krithika pragashira pushya maga and so on these are all the names of the wives of the moons which were given and every day the moon appears in one of these nakshatras so that we understand this to the sidereal uh, point in addition to that we had the concept of a lunar month the lunar month was when the full moon appears in a certain nakshatra we take the name of that particular nakshatra for example if the full moon appears in the chitra nakshatra the purnima in chitra nakshatra that month was called the chaitra masa in some parts of india they use the purnima as a marker of the lunar month in some parts of india we use the amavasya as the beginning of the lunar month so it's called the amanta month or the purnima month month so we see the chaitra masa is different for different parts of india slightly offset but the phenomena is the same either the amavasya or the uh, full moon has to be in chitra nakshatra so uh, which which or nakshatra that is so we got 12 of these uh, uh, lunar months over here based on that in addition to that to mark the passage of the sun ancient indians divided the sky into 30 degree segments 12 of them and those were the rashi the very familiar rashi is the makara that we're going to talk about today dhanush and other these are all the rashis and they divided the sky into these rashis in addition so this is the basis of what we call the luni solar calendar and everything in indian astronomy can be understood if we understand this uh, uh, the the nakshatras and the rashi and how they are presented in the sky so from that the question how do we mark time in the panchanga so to start with the basic unit of time is a muhurta and the muhurta is a 1/30th of a day or it is 48 minute interval panchanga is a five dimensional measurement of time that's why pancha anga so you got nakshatra tithi vara yoga and karana nakshatra we already saw it takes 27 days for the moon to come back to the same nakshatra so every day you have a different nakshatra this is a sidereal month tithi is all of these that i mentioned over here from prathama dvitiya tritiya chaturthi all the way to amavasya and all the way down to chaturdashi and purnami so this is the tithi of the day then vara we'll see the next slide what the vara the weekday is and the yoga was supposed to be the angle between the sun and the moon basically by looking at the longitude of the sun longitude of the moon and i will talk about coordinate systems a little later and by understanding that they also understood uh, uh, the yoga and karana was a measure of tithi by 2 so in india we always measured these quantities these five quantities at sunrise when sunrise starts these quantities are determined for the day so that is the understanding that we have on the panchanga so from this we go to what is the weekday itself so the weekday in india was uh, like we can see ravi soma mangala budha uh, guru shukra and shani these are the traditional weekdays over here and one can ask questions how old is this uh, description of this weekday well we can see it in aryabhatiya in aryabhatiya itself we are seeing mention of the weekdays as well as in surya siddhanta even in surya siddhanta we are seeing the uh, definition of the weekdays and, uh, and so on so th- some people say that weekdays came from the west and so on but then we have to then ask, answer the question then why is the very ancient surya siddhanta talking about it and uh, and also arya bhatia now uh, we can also understand the weekdays we can go to solar and lunar months so the solar months are mentioned by the rashi and i already talked about the rashi mesha rishabha mithuna kataka and others all the way down to uh, meena rashi over here and the lunar months we already saw that also when the full moon appears that is the purnima month or the uh, amavasya month we had the chaitra vaishaka jaishta and other things up to falguna these are the typical lunar months that we have and the solar months that we have lunar month calculation and reconciliation solar months is not easy because there was a intercalary or adhika masa computing when the adhika masa should be inserted and how we deal with that i am not going into uh, that because there's much more to discuss before we can go into such details 
So uh, looking at the night sky, the nakshatras and Rashi. So from our position, here is the sun and the earth is going around the sun. And as we go around the sun, we can see in the night sky, this would be the uh, uh, Rashi that we can see. In the day sky, obviously the sun is there. We can't see Leo, for example. In this time in January, February, we are looking at uh, this side towards Aquarius, Pisces, Capricorn. We are seeing this in the night sky. So the, the, the Rashis are over here, Mesha, Vrishabha, Mithuna, Katakana, Meena, Kumbha, Makara, and others. And we can see the nakshatras around them. For example, where we have uh, 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 Makara, we are looking at uh, Uttara, Ashada, Shravana, and Dhanishta nakshatras. These are the nakshatras that are uh, in this part of the sky. So we have an understanding of which are the principal stars in that zodiac or constellation or Rashi. So we can understand the, uh, the distribution of the Rashi in 30 degrees. And in that 30 degrees, we have got in 13 and one third degree segments, we have got different nakshatras. So one has got to understand uh, some of these things when we uh, talk about a solar month in terms of Rashi, when we talk about the lunar month in terms of the nakshatra. So this is the uh, reconciliation of these two is what all of Indian calendars are all about. And we have got for the last 5,000 years, many time constants and, cal and calculations. For example, like I said, one muhurta is 48 minutes. If you take 30 muhurta, there is an ahoratram or a sidereal day of 24 hours. If you take 30 ahoratrams, you get one masa. So 30 titis is approximately a synodic month. If you take two masas, we get one ritu or one season, approximately 60 days. If you take three ritus, we get an ayanam, about 180 degrees, 180 days. Two ayanams make a varsha or a lunar year of 360 days. Where do we find all these things in antiquity and where did the first place of these things come? We can see how old the Indian calendar is by seeing that in Rig Veda itself, if, for example, in this particular verse, we are seeing the year of 360 days. And we are also seeing in Professor Abhayankar, he's talking about how do you reconcile in the Rig Vedic times from the lunar calendar to the Uttarayana, Dakshinayana, 365.24 days. And Professor Abhayankar say in those days, there was an Atiratra sacrifice that will take 4.5 to 6 days, during which uh, uh, this, this, this uh, shortfall is uh, uh, accommodated for. Then we are seeing in Atharva Veda, in this particular verse of Atharva Veda, we are seeing that Rohita created Adhikamasa. It is also there in Rig Veda, which means as ancient as Rig Veda, ancient Indians already have understood how to map the phenomena in the skies and measure it uh, with the passage of time. So uh, we are seeing Adhikamasa over here. We are seeing the lunar month over here and attempts to synchronize it with the solar calendar, with Adhikamasa over here. Very, very interesting to see some of these things. And across India, we are seeing many, many calendars. So for example, we are seeing a, a Luni solar calendar, solar calendar, of course, the new national calendar is mathematical, so we won't go over there. In the Luni solar, like I said, we have the Amanta or the Purni Amanta. Amanta starts from Amavasya to Amavasya, and Purniyamanta from Pournami to Pournami. In the Amanta, we have Southern variation, Western variation. And in the Purniyamanta, we have the Northern variation. And uh, we are seeing the solar calendar followed in, uh, in Kerala, as well as in Oriya, in Tamil Nadu, as well as in Bengal. And if you uh, also take a look at the eras they uh, marked, we have Vikrama era, the Samvatsara cycle, the Kollam cycle, the Shaka, Kali, and uh, Bengali. We'll talk later about Vedavirarya's works also on identifying the eras. And we also have uh, when the Adhikamasa comes, different kind of uh, ideas on the Shaya schools, Eastern, Northwestern, Southern. So various computations all over India to mark the passage of time. And we can see in this map over here, whichever is blue, is Purni Amanta month, whichever is in uh, green is the Southern Amanta and this orange is Western Amanta. So across India, we are seeing such variations that is talking to us about how old this passage of time is. We have the same calendars, but regional variations based on marking Amanta, Purni Amanta, that is different. And the computation of the Adhikamasa, that is also a little different. That is what we're seeing here. 
and I'm not going to read this, we also had a 60-year Samvatsara cycle. The Samvatsara cycle is one where ancient Indians had observed Jupiter takes, or Guru, takes 12 years to come back to the same nakshatra. And uh, uh, Saturn takes 30 years to come back to the same nakshatra. So their resonance, 12 times 5, 30 times 2, gives 60. When Guru and Shani return to the same uh, zodiacal plane, that is a, a measure of a 60-year Samvatsara cycle. So currently, we are in the Plava, uh, which is in 2021 20, to 2022, and we will transition soon to the next uh, Samvatsara cycle. Now, we talked about uh, the sidereal month. We talked about the synodic month. We talked about uh, lunar calendar. We talked about the solar calendar with Uttarayana and Dakshinayana. We talked about Adhikamasa. We talked about uh, uh, regional variations in the calendars and so on. We should also talk about the era. Each other is not enough just to have a calendar to mark one year. You, as a civilization, you want to see how many years has elapsed since some uh, event has happened. So one of the most ancient epochs that is encoded in our tables is the Kali Yuga. We have Puranas talking about Kali Yuga. Aryabhata, Suri Siddhanta refer to this. Pulisa Siddhanta, Brahmagupta, Al Baruni, all of them refer to this one. In Aihole Temple Epigraphy, we are seeing uh, the same reference to this entity. And Dr. M. L. Raja has given many, many uh, epigraphy evidences from Southern India, Northern India, referring to Kali Yuga. And uh, this Frenchman, Simon de la Louvre, in 1687, he went to Thailand and he got an ancient astronomy manuscript which seemed to have the longitude of uh, Varnasi in it and encoding this epoch. He gave this to Cassini, who was a mathematician in Italy, who studied that and declared that it starts on the midnight of February 17th or 18th, 3102 BCE. Later, Britishers like Playfair, Bentley, Colebrook, they all studied this and they also confirmed that it is February 18th, 3102 BCE. Turns out to be a rare conjunction of planet, sun, moon, and Revati nakshatra. And this is the traditional marker of Kali Yuga. Even today, many traditional Hindus, when they say their prayers, they mark the time since Kali Yuga, the passage of Kali Yuga. So it's very deeply ingrained uh, in our consciousness throughout India. And you can simulate this in the planetarium software, for example. You can go there and try to see when were all these planets clustered in the Revati nakshatra. We can see Chandra over here, Guru and Shukran over here, Surya, Shani, Budhan, Mangala, and all of them in Revati nakshatra. And this happened February 18th, 3102 BCE. Such a clustering of all these planets in Revati has not happened since. So clearly, we can see that Indians have been marking time at least from that particular time. So which are the eras that we mark in the Indian calendar? We have got the Kali Yuga era, which is, like I said, uh, 3102 BCE. We got the Buddha Nirvana era, which goes to 2134 BCE. And uh, Mahavira Nirvana era to 1189 BCE. Going all the way to Shaka in 583 BCE and going to Shalivahana in 78 CE, and so on. Some of these dates might appear strange to you. So I refer you to the work of Vedvirarya, who's done a lot of work in understanding the epigraphy issues, in understanding the various eras in the Indian calendars. And he's done uh, excellent work in trying to reconcile that. And he shows a 550 to 600 year difference between the Shaka, uh, where we are measuring Shaka and where it really is. So with this, we also understand from our traditional records much of the calendrical events that happened in our past. So when we talk about calendars, it is important to understand the eras in addition. So perhaps one of the greatest uh, understandings we can have is in Srimad Bhagavatam, which talks about uh, the, the yuga cycle, Chatur Yuga cycle. So the Chatur Yuga cycle has got Satya Yuga, Treta Yuga, Dwapara, and Kali Yuga in a ratio of 4 is to 3 is to 2 is to 1 starting with 432,000 years or 4,32,000 years for the Kali Yuga times 2 times 3 times 4. If you add all of them, we get 4,003,020,000 years for an entire Chatur Yuga. So in our Yuga model, we are saying that 71 of these form um, uh, ma from Maha Yuga, we get Manvantara. From that, 14 of that forming a Kalpa. And a Kalpa it is approximately 4.32 billion years. It is said to be one day of Brahma in which creation is done. 
Then Brahma rests for some time, so called the Sandhya Kalam. And then one night of Brahma also takes an equal amount of time and we have Pralaya. And in our uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, we are told that each Brahma lives for 100 such Brahma years and we are in the 51st year of the current Brahma. And amazingly, this seems to uh, match well with our current understanding of the cosmos. If you take the uh, uh, Big Bang theory, for example, starting from about uh, 13.8 billion years ago, these numbers seem to come very, very close to uh, some, some of these things. And uh, uh, one very important thing to understand for Indian calendars is that we are seeing the Indian calendar was changed at various periods in time. And why did they change this calendar? We need to understand that. And that is because of something called precision. Our Earth is doing something called precision, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. And that requires us to change the calendrical uh, uh, starting point at various points in time. So ancient Indians were aware of a lot of things that is happening in, the, in, the, in, in our existence. For example, what we call the cardinal points of astronomy. They knew the winter solstice point, summer solstice point, vernal equinox point, autumn equinox point. These are the four cardinal points of astronomy and ancient Indians knew these very, very well. They also had reference plane looking at the horizon or looking ecliptic means that is where the sun is going. Sun is appearing to go on the, on the ecliptic as well as equator. Equator is a place, the celestial equator is a place where the sun will be on the date of the equinox. It will be exactly there. Then it appears to go north up to 23.3 degrees, then south up to minus 23.3 degrees. This is Uttarayana, Dakshinayana. On the day of equinox, it will be exactly on the celestial equator. So Indians knew about these things in addition. Also, they knew the celestial pole. The Earth is rotating about this axis over here, tilted slightly at uh, 23.5 degrees or so. So this rotation in the northern hemisphere is point star called Dhruva, what we call Dhruva Tara. But in English, we call it Polaris. So it is pointing to that northern hemisphere. We don't have a pole star in the south, but ancient Indians knew about the celestial pole in addition. Also the directions north, south, east and west, as well as zenith. These things are important because when we go to Siddhanta astronomy, where calendars, measurements are done, people can ask the question, how did ancient Indians measure these things? Why is it necessary to study these? Because there are Westerners who say Indians did not know how to measure, they did not know how to observe, and they learned from the Babylonians and Greeks. So it's important to understand some of these things. First of all, if you have to measure, what did you measure the skies with? For 5,000 years, we have got a history of measurements. For example, in Harappa, we are seeing that water clocks, this is an example of water clocks recovered from Harappa, where water dripping is uh, uh, calibrated for time measurement. And in Vedanga Jyotisha, 1400 BC, we are seeing mentions of this. By the time you come to Aryabhata, he's talking about all these instruments, shadow instruments, semicircle, staff, circle, umbrella, water instruments, gnomon, and other such things. Aryabhata also had a globe. He could uh, turn the globe, uh, which appeared to be something of this nature. Varahamira, he's talking about graphic calculations in 500 current era. He's talking about that. When you go to Brahmagupta in 600 current era, he's talking about more things, quadrant, bow, uh, karthari, scissors kind of uh, thing and so on. Bhaskara one is talking about a circular platform with graduated circumference. By the way, this is also there in Harappa. This is from Harappa. If you go to Harappa, Lothal, you can see in uh, Lothal this brick platform that talks about this. Lalla is talking about uh, armillary sphere and other things. By the time we come to Mahendra Suri in 1300s and so on, he's also using astrolabes, which came from the Arabs. And by the time we come to Maharaja Jai Singh, he's using European instruments in addition to make measurements. So the bottom line is Indians have 5,000 years or more of using measurements. And the question one needs to ask is, why were they using all these measurements? Why was it important? So they were using that to try to estimate the movement of heavenly bodies. That is what leads to the development of mathematics and everything is trigonometry, calculus, everything originates from understanding the skies. So we have got three coordinate systems if you want to map the skies. One is called the equatorial, I'll not talk about that. And then something else called altitude azimuth, I'll not talk about that. Indians use something called the ecliptic coordinate system. In the ecliptic coordinate system, 
uh, it was necessary to have the understanding where does the sun traverse? This is the path of the ecliptic. This is the path of the equator on which the sun is on the day of the equinox and understanding uh, various other things like where is the ecliptic pole and so on. The zero point was always vernal equinox. You can't read this, but the zero point is vernal equinox. So with respect to this longitude, all the measurements were done in ancient India. What we are seeing is because of a phenomenon called precision, I'll define that shortly, it was necessary to change the reference point in Indian astronomy whenever the reference point over here changed. And we are seeing, for example, Mriga Shirsha, that was at vernal equinox in 4000 BCE. Rohini was at uh, vernal equinox in 3000 BCE. Kritika in 2300 BC, Bharani in 1300 BC, Ashwini in 800 BC. So as these reference points changed, ancient Indians also changed the uh, reference point. That is what we are seeing. What is this precision I talked about? It is a 25,700 year cycle. Earth, in addition to rotating once in 24 hours, in addition to going around the sun once in 365 days, uh, so 0.24 days, it is also doing something called precision. If you play with the top as a child, you take a top, tie a rope and do this. The, the top spins very, very fast, but sometimes there's a slow wobble also in the top. In addition to the fast spin, slowly it seems to be wobbling and Earth is doing that. The fast spin is 24 hours. The slow wobble, it takes around 25,700 years. So today we are pointing at Dhruva, which is in Polaris. But then uh, 14,000 years ago, it was Vega or Abhijit. Abhijit was our pole star, Brahma Rishi. But today it is uh, uh, Polar, Polaris over here. When the Puranas were written, Thuban was Dhruva for us. I'll show that later on when I tell you the story of Dhruva. So this precision has been studied by a lot of ancient Indian scientists, including to mention it, Suri Siddhanta. Suri Siddhanta has got a particular passage where it is saying in one yuga, remember the Chatur Yuga is 4,320,000 years. And this is saying that it will complete 600 revolutions in that time. So from that, we can compute something called Ayana Chalana. Ayana Chalana is an Indian word for precision. And that comes, uh, what, what the Suri Siddhanta is saying is that from the zero point, which is in Meshirashi, it, is, uh, it goes up 49800 BC, it goes to uh, 27 degrees, comes down to zero degrees, goes to minus 27 degrees, and goes back to zero. So in 7,200 years, it completes one revolution. So we can compute this 600 times 27 times four segments, segment one, segment two, segment three, segment four, then convert the degrees into minutes, convert the minutes into seconds, divided by 4,320,000 years, we get 54 arc seconds per year. This is the precision rate that is computed by our ancient ancestors in the Surya Siddhanta. Very, very interesting to see this. Many people have estimated the precision. And what is this precision? We are using our coordinate system starting in vernal equinox today with at the Mesha Rashi, we call this the Nirayana system. So sidereal year is measured when Surya appears in the Mesha Rashi. We have one more system called Sayana. Sayana is tropical, where we are measuring the year from one equinox point to the next equinox point. And we can observe that if both the Sayana and Nirayana system co coincide at one point in time, they'll start slipping. Year by year, they'll start slipping by approximately 50.2 arc seconds a year. This is called Ayanamsa or Ayana Chalana. Way back in 600 current era, Lalla had measured this to six degrees Ayanamsa. So Suri Siddhanta, we don't know the date, very, very ancient. It is saying 54 arc seconds per year. Parashara Siddhanta can be dated to 1400 BC in the works by Professor R. N. Ayinga. And that is also using Suri Siddhanta's value of 54 arc seconds a year. Vrithagarga in 500 BC, Professor Abhayankar is interpreted his statement of one degree for every 100 years to mean 36 arc seconds per year. The Greek Hipparchus in 120 BC copied the same as Vrithagarga through the library at Alexandria. He had information, he used the same value through 36 arc seconds per year. In China, Yuxi in this time frame used 72 arc seconds per year. Aryabhata had used 48 arc seconds per year. 48 is better than 54. 
the correct value is 50.2 and gv krishna swami is showing us this the arab arabs learned everything from indians and so they learned from suri siddhanta translations and uh, this arab used 54 arc seconds per year in this time frame then by the time we come to baskara the second who was in ujjain in this time frame he had 48.6 even better than aryabhata's measurement raja jay singh he had estimated this to 51.6 Uh, degrees uh, arc seconds per year and patani samanta chandrashekar who was in odisha he did not use any telescopes or anything just the naked eye observations using ancient indian methods classical methods he estimated this to 49.179 amazing amazing value which comes today to the modern value 50.2 what this is telling us is that indians understood phenomena of precision and had instruments were measuring it over time changing the calendrical system and so on and today we can use this precision to date how old is some of the calendars how old some of our stories for example everybody here knows the story of dhruva dhruva's father had two wives suruchi the favored wife and suniti was dhruva's mother and he had an unhappy childhood father favored the step brother ignored him so uh, one fine day he's so unhappy that he leaves home to seek vishnu's blessings to find out where is my place in this world if i cannot sit on my father's lap and he meets a saptarishi who tell him how to meditate on vishnu finally vishnu blesses him and uh, dhruva wants nothing vishnu asks what boon do you want he wants nothing he's in a state of bliss so he makes him into a motionless star in the sky and then he says all the planets and stars will rotate around you including the saptarishis and we can see that if you take a dslr camera and you point it to the north and keep it open on the exposure you'll see something called star trails this is what we mean when we say everything is rotating about dhruva this is our present day dhruva and in the dhruva story when vishnu gives pole star status to dhruva he says your mother suniti will also be a star nearby well if we go and look at the sky today we find that where dhruva is there is no close companion what happened is the story wrong in vishnu purana where what what happened over here well if we use uh, precision and go back in time we understand there was one more star called thuban in 3000 bce when thuban was at the pole star point it had a nearby companion which vishnu has promised that is suniti so this is telling us that the story of dhruva is at least 5000 years and we used precision to estimate that antiquity there is one more story about uh, aditi aditi is the mother of all the devas the adityas and others so in the aitreya brahmana we are seeing in in this particular translation it is saying the yagna went away from devatas and they were unable to perform any further ceremony they, they did not know when should we start the festival when should we observe the festival they did not know where it gone to they said to aditi let us know the yagna through thee aditi said let it be so tatastu but i will choose a boon from you and they said choose and she chose this boon she said all yagna will begin and end with me clearly over here we are seeing that the calendar has changed calendar has changed because of precision vernal equinox position has changed and the indians did not know how to perform the sacrifice and they have a reference to aditi over here and if you look at the work of balagangadhar tilak as well as professor abayankar they have referred to this as the era of aditi when the vernal equinox was in punarvashu punarvashu is where we have diti and arundhati these are the stars that today we call uh, castor and pollux in greek so when uh, when when vernal equinox the sun is at this point it happened in punarvashu this was in 6000 bce it is marking when uh, the calendar point the equinox point had changed to aditi that is mentioned in aitreya purana so this is now giving us a glimpse of how our knowledge of mathematics our knowledge of ayana chalana and can be used to try to estimate when some of these ancient uh, stories have been mentioned in our texts so back to makara sankranti so we have precession of 25771 years for one full circle 360 degrees so that means for every degree it takes 72 years approximately that means we have 27 nakshatras the the that the, the because of precision the position of a nakshatra at a equinox point or so it will take about this much of years to change about 954 years to change or in rashi 
it is there in rashi for about 20 uh, 2148 years in uh, is this should be 2021 in 2021 december 22nd we observed that winter solstice is in dhanush rashi it is not in uh, uh, makar uh, rashi it is in dhanush rashi if we do uh, 2022 minus 2147 this approximate amount of time is there in each rashi because of precession we are getting approximately 125 bce so if we say at some point in time makar sankranti coincided with uttarayana that coincidence would have happened way back approximately uh, 125 bc perhaps up to 400 bc that is what we have learned after looking at all this mathematics and astronomy and measurements and coordinate systems that ancient indians were doing over time so uh, i i could stop over here uh, madhu ji but i can also talk a little bit about Please how do. the westerners position it otherwise yes okay so uh, it, it appears that the westerners starting from the colonial people all the way through the present times have always said indians did not know how to measure the skies they made mistakes they copied everything from the greeks and the babylonians and so on so very quickly i will try to show all this has come because the spurious aryan invasion migration narrative this narrative is saying there was an aryan invasion in 1500 bce when these illiterate people nomads from central asia they destroyed the superior harappa civilization and india had to wait another 1000 years because india was overrun by these caste people who had cows and worshiping and uh, the sanskrit people who did not even have a language to write in did not have a script to write in they waited 1000 years for civilization to return to magadha ashokan times after the greeks had uh, contact with them then suddenly we had brahmi script and other things we became civilized then then they say how can you have enough gestation time for knowledge generation mathematics astronomy medicine you are a very young civilization therefore you must have learned everything from the greeks babylonians and so on so what do they tell us they are telling us that math sciences came to india from the greeks they are saying that brahmi the script came from semitic scripts aramaic into india karoshti aramaic into india the babylonian people taught us astronomy the aryans brought sanskrit into india the turkic muslims they got us the culture cuisine architecture music and civilization to india the british taught us science technology and rational thought and these days they also say bhakti came from saint thomas who landed in kerala so <laughs> all of these narratives are what are imposed on us all spurious narratives it greatly distorts the history of the indian civilization all the dates and anchor points of chronology and every single aspect of the ancient indian knowledge systems and our identity is all impacted by this just let us take calendars only calendars i want to see what did what was calendars like in various other civilizations if you look at the ancient egyptians at that time there is a civil calendar based on solar 365 days per year they had three seasons 120 days each which comes to the lunar cycle as you can see 360 days they had an intercalary month of 5 days which they treated outside the year they also had a common calendar people used which was exactly the indian calendar the luni solar calendar for festivals intercalary month added every 2 to 3 years to sync with the solar year this is egypt if you go to babylon 1500 bce they had a luni solar calendar with 12 lunar months the month for them remember our month lunar month begins with either purnami or amavasya for them it was a crescent moon sighting on the western horizon at sunset for us it was at sunrise it is for them it's at sunset intercalary month was inserted as needed by royal decree whenever the royal uh, mathematician said that they would insert that month after 499 bce they had something called the uh, 19 year cycle which the greeks later on used as a maiden cycle and they said in a fixed period of time they always have intercalary months which is different from the indians uh, method which only when required it will be inserted in the ancient greek calendar well they had calendars from 800 bce which begins with an autumn and winter they had 12 lunar months no intercalary months 354 days because lunar uh, year over here and uh, they had something called the athens attics calendar around 400 bc or so which had one 12 months of 29 to 30 days 
intercalary month for the 13th month for alignment. This is after contact with India. We are seeing Indian kind of lunar month has come in over here. The ancient Roman calendar, they also use a lunar 12 months of 29 to 30 days. Some intercalation, intercalation means they had suspended the calendar during winter. During winter, they say, let's not measure the time. And that is the way they got synchronism back to solar calendar. At the time of Julius Caesar, 46 BC, they had something called the Julian calendar. And the era they marked is 753 BCE, the year of Rome's founding. And this calendar was used for 1,600 years in Europe. So it had 12 months of 30 and 31 days with 365 days and 366 in leap years. And this was later on modified by the Christians, the Byzantines, to mark, instead of marking the reference point to 753 BC, they pointed it to Christian era, saying Christ birth and so on. It was modified by then. So this calendar was used for 1600 BC, uh, years. And what is this calendar, Julian calendar? So these are the months they had. And before 45 BC, this was a length for each month. You can see that uh, over here in July was 31. August was only 29 days. But after the reign of Augustus emperor, he made August also after his name to 31 days, same as Julius Caesar's Julian. So we see 31 days for both. And uh, these are the months in the English calendar. So we are seeing a very strange kind of calendar, which has got no relation to the, the physics that we are seeing in the Indian calendar, for example. By the time we came to 1582 current era, because of precision of equinox, things had slipped tremendously, tremendously so that the observation of the Christian Easter festival was out by several days, maybe 20 days or so on. So the Gregorian monks in 1582, they revised this calendar, it is called Gregorian calendar since then, where several dates were chopped out, as you can see, uh, October starts with 1, 2, 3, 4 and jumps to 15. So several days are removed to accommodate for that. And uh, the calculation of leap year was also changed to have better accuracy. So this is the calendar that we are following today in the English uh, methods. One more thing I want to point out. So we saw the calendars, how it is the state of calendar in various parts of the world, including recent Europe. And we saw that they are not based on very, very scientific ways of doing things. And we have seen that the Indian calendar was based on clear understanding of various entities, measurements, and the efforts of Indians to use mathematics, astronomy, to refine the calendrical systems and passage of time. Even in the Rashis, Pingree, for example, says, he's a professor in New York University, was rather, he's declared that Indians got the Rashi model from, uh, uh, from, the, from the Greeks, Greeks and Romans and so on. However, unfortunately, uh, this is not a correct statement. If you look at Ptolemy's work, Ptolemy in, uh, in his work, he's pointing out to a 13th Rashi, which is called this entity over here, serpent over here. This is Ptolemy's list, not just 12 Rashis, but this one. So even if you say there is borrowing, what is the direction of borrowing? That is a question to ask over here. Clearly, we are seeing differences in, in the calendrical system so here. And in my talks, I've talked a lot about knowledge transfer from India. There are several uh, uh, items I pointed out, phenomena I pointed out over here. For example, prior to 13, uh, 3000 BCE, there are migrations. In genetic records, we have records of migrations, as well as in Vedic accounts in the Dasaragnya and others, we have accounts of migrations out of India, when knowledge went out of India into the fertile crescent and other places. Between 3000 to 2000 BC, Harappa was trading with Mesopotamia. And this is a time when knowledge was going to Babylon and other such places. 2000 BCE, we know there was a 100 year monsoon failure from climatology studies. We know that. That caused a great migration from India out to the fertile crescent, places like the Tigris, Nile, and Euphrates river valleys. Indians had gone there and we got evidence from genetics and uh, knowledge systems and so on. I talked about this in my talks. Between 500 BC to 400 BC, Greek travelers like Pythagoras, Skylax, Democritus, Pyron, and others had come to India, taken knowledge directly. After Alexander, contacts with uh, Indo-Greek kingdoms up to 200 BC, knowledge is transferred. Roman trade, Romans were coming to India to trade, and we know that from Periplus of Eritrean Sea, from 100 BC to 300 current era, a lot of Indian knowledge went out. Silk route. Uh, there was informal trade network, Southeast Asia, China, Central Asia, Mediterranean. This was also conduit for knowledge transfer. In medieval times, trade with Syria, Armenia, Persia, and beyond, 
even this was accounted for knowledge. Many, many data points I've collected for all of these things. During the Arab times, from 711 current era after Bin Qasim uh, uh, conquered Sindh, to the Abbasid kingdom, uh, empire rather, and uh, onward to Europe, we have no what knowledge transfers. The Muslim period from 1000 current era to 1700s, many works were translated Arabic, Persian, and we know about these. Carolian era from 1700s to 1940s, many translations of works to English, German, and French. So these are all the mechanisms and routes by which Indian knowledge was transferred to the rest of the world. And we have got many, many data points that uh, show these things. So if you saw in the calendar system, there was some similarity in the lunar calendar of Egypt, of the Greeks, of the Romans, and so on. Know that this was the conduit by which that knowledge went out there. So in my closing remarks, I have tried to talk, I know it is not very uh, clear over here, but I tried to talk about Indian calendar systems and shown that they date back to great antiquity. And the antiquity we have attested using the astronomical measurements and our understanding of precision. And people who say that Indians could not measure precision, for example, Pingri says, Varaha Mihira was the first person who talked about precision in India. How spurious is that? Even Parashara Siddhanta is talking about uh, uh, precision, and that is dated by Arna Inga to about 1400 BCE. And uh, like I said, Suri Siddhanta, Aryabhata, all of them are talking about Ayana Chalana and others. So clearly, whatever uh, Pingri is asserting is not based on facts. That is a problem. It's not based on evidence. We are seeing lunisolar calendar with intercalary months, and this is exported to many other civilizations too. We saw that. We also saw that because we are using vernal equinox position as a zero point for the longitudes, it was necessary to adjust that because of the phenomenon of precision which takes 25,700 years for a cycle. And we have seen that evidence. We talked about the story of Aditi, for example, many other stories, Dhruva, many, many stories are there, including the actual measurements. So the impetus, this was the impetus for making measurements. I mean, why would you make measurements of the sky? The sky is static. Sky is not static. Things are changing all the time. Even if you understood a periodic motion and that periodic motion does not change, then why do you bother with measurements? You're doing measurements because of the precision phenomena, 25,000 years, things are changing and you want better and better measurements. That is what we're seeing. And the mathematics match that. Indians developed uh, trigonometry, they measured spherical uh, trigonometry, calculus and other things were all invented to uh, accommodate for these measurements and such things. And they had models of increasing complexity over time. In this talk, I'm not present in this, but in other talks, I talked about uh, models of astronomy of ancient Indians. So Western assertions can be contested from several directions. Over here, I just presented the calendars of the ancient civilizations and the knowledge transmission routes. Uh, so with that, I think I will uh, stop over here, Madhuji, and uh, we can have a discussion based on some of these things. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's mind blowing. Um, and the first thing that comes to any lay person's mind is, what were the instruments for doing it? Because scientists today with all the technology or what have you are still fumbling around, you know, understanding the nature of the cosmos. And here, not only did these rishis do it, but the, the question then, two, two questions. One is, of course, uh, encoding it through Puranic Kathas. And was was that method chosen so that through these stories it becomes part of uh, folk wisdom because this panchang is actually part of the uh, bharatiya dna right. you know people right. who the personal emotional lives of indians yes. are so yes. at least traditional indians we're not talking about the wokes and the westernized indians the emotional life is so tuned to Panjang. For example, nobody has to tell people in any part of India, now this is the time that you need to take a dip into this uh, right. river game. Right. Right. There's no invitation sent for the comb. People spontaneously on their own gather. I mean, a politician has to bribe people to come to a political rally. <laughs> But, uh, you know, 
people throughout right. to, to come right. to Mela or any other occasion. I mean, for example, uh, not just Makar Sankran, but also every month uh, there are days or yes. those days for taking a bath or doing things certain ways, foods that you have on special days. Now, that emotional link to the DNA, I mean, is it because it was part of Quranic Kathas? Through them, this entire science becomes part of folk wisdom? Is that yes. why it was done that way? Yes, I, I, would, I, would, I would say that and venture to say that because our rishis knew that the human mind is craving for entertainment at any given time. In today, we have anecdotal uh, evidence of that. People go from Twitter to Facebook to Instagram. Every second WhatsApp, you want to be entertained. So this probably was the case even previous time, days when they knew. I wouldn't call that... it entertaining, but I would see. I mean, Ramayana and Mahabharata are not exactly entertainment. They're but you can't, remember, you, you can't remember something. For example, if I go to a class on uh, geometry and they're talking theorems, after 45 yeah. minutes, my mind is blank. I've gone. Yes, I agree. <laughs> But no, what I'm trying to say, storytelling has been yes. an integral part of imparting yes. very deep scientific philosophical. Very truth. true. We are seeing that again, yes. pedagogy in ancient India was based for the masses with stories. Stories were a critical component of conveying some wisdom, whether it's a moral wisdom, whether it's an astronomy wisdom, any other kind of wisdom or dharma uh, idea was communicated with stories. And we're seeing a tradition of storytelling throughout India for a very, very long period of time, not just in Puranas. So yes, knowledge was open part, to stories. Yeah. The sad part is when, for example, I see on TV, our TV serials are constantly taking these Puranic Kathas and enacting them in very melodramatic ways. I really wish that they would connect it to the science of it. Otherwise, it appears so mumbo jumbo and fantasy and, you know, all that. Like, I've seen this uh, Chandrama ke Sattais uh, Patmiya ki kahani mm -hmm. on one of the TV serials. Mm -hmm. uh, I was so gross. It was so grossly done. So that it becomes easy to dismiss it. It becomes so easy to dismiss it as just mumbo jumbo. And it's really sad because... Um, the distortion that comes, therefore, in our perceptions of this past heritage, um, it's like fantasy land, and fantasy land also of the kind that uh, defies comprehension. So that's one. Secondly, uh, the, the other point that occurred to me is this. You know, you talked about the epoch of Kaliyuk, mm -hmm. epoch of Kali, mm -hmm. February 18th, 3102 BCE. Right. Yes. When a certain constellation of stars brought about this. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the question that, and this is something that I want you to, uh, you to answer. The earlier was just a comment and mm -hmm. sharing with you my concerns. This question I want you to answer to whatever level you can, which is mm -hmm. if Kaliyuk is the product of astronomical. Uh, cosmic dance. Well, then we are helpless. We uh, human beings have no real choice except to suffer it. I used to think that you know it's our karma that mm. decides what yoga we create for ourselves. But if it's all these nakshatras, we just better sit back and wait for mm. nakshatras mm. to mm. change mm. their positioning, and then maybe back to satyoga or whatever yoga is due next very very interesting perspective which um, uh, dare i say uh, it, it 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 is a fatalistic view on on uh, on the way the uh, indian jyotish is presented so i i think i think um, kali yuga marker to 3102 bce this was we see the evidence of this in suri siddhanta in aryabhata's works and from there on we are seeing this some one school of thought says these huge numbers that we are seeing in Srimad Bhagavatam and other places, these were done in order to have astronomical precision. If you want precision in the calculations, because if you remember, I said if you do 600 revolutions in 4,320,000 years, 
you're getting a kind of accuracy that you can't do if you just use simpler, smaller units of time. It'll be less accurate. As time moves, it'll be less accurate. So there's one school of thought that says that. Other school of thought says that, yes, the Kali Yuga uh, marker has been used in India, not only from Aryabhata's time, but much more earlier. And it is indeed marking this uh, conjunction of planets and Revati Nakshatra. And some people say that's a date when Bhagavan Krishna left the earth. And uh, um, uh, this, this era that we know as Kali Yuga has started right over there. And there are yet others who are trying to say, let's take a, a differentiation of the divine years and the human years and they have positioned the entire Chaturyuga as one cycle of precision. For example, uh, Lahiri and others in the Bengal, they have positioned that as uh, um, uh, 24,000 years. So they try to say that we are now past the descending Kali, past the ascending Kali, we've gone to the Dwapara, the next, next Yuga, and so on. So there are several attempts to try and understand this passage of time. And one cannot say with definite, uh, definiteness what it is. If you take a look at the Western people that try to divide the age of mankind into something called Stone Age, into something called uh, Chalcolithic Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and now the uh, and after that the Steam Age, and now we are in the Technological Age. So we are seeing attempts to try and divide human experience in a linear way over here, and in a cyclic fashion in the Indian context, which says that you're going to see things come and go in cycles. So I, I think it's one of a philosophical um, understanding over here. I try to come with um, uh, uh, seeing how these eras, markers are used in history, what they might mean to us. In that context, I am looking at Kali Yuga in, in exactly these contexts. One is as a time marker, 3102 BC, clustering in Revati Nakshatra. Yes, we can say that. The, the, some others are trying to associate that with uh, Mahabharata war, with uh, other chronological events. That That is a big question over there. Lots of issues. My are... question, Dr. Vedam, was not to do with dating issues. Mm -hmm. My question was to do with Kali Yuga is associated with a certain degradation in human yes. values. Yes, yes. Now, is that degradation occurring because the nakshatras are positioned in a certain way? Or is there, are there some other forces at work? We, we cannot answer because that with such greatness at all. Because the descriptions of Kali Yoga no. are very accurate. Very true. You know, in, in a classical text. Very true. They're so very accurate, uh, even in Mahabharata, uh, what will be happening. So this ability to see what's going to happen several thousand years hence, Mm -hmm. And to such precision, the mm -hmm. nature of the degradation also True. is so precisely mm -hmm. listed. It just leaves you completely um, befuddled. How could this be? It's, it's amazing enough that they could figure out the cosmic dance. True. True. Uh, so thousands of years before anybody even understood that the earth was round and not flat. Right. I mean, right. Oh, Europeans right. got it as true, very true. true. Yes, but yes. to be able to foresee Kali Yuga and to be able to describe what's likely to happen, what's the explanation for that? Right. right. So I, I, I have little difficulty in answering that, uh, Madhuji, and I'll tell you why. One reason is enormous time scales that have been allocated to the Srimad Bhagavatam based uh, uh, Chaturyuga system, going back to many, many millions of years ago. I would like to uh, be driven by the, and when I'm saying this, don't misunderstand where I'm coming from over here, be, uh, by the evidence. Our evidence today is talking about how old, for example, the human species, and we cannot really push it back to that great antiquity at all. So we have to work with much lesser time frames we're interested. Even if you're talking about Homo erectus going back to 2 million years, 3 million years, there's a certain time frame from which we can talk. So this is the fossil evidence. I'm not saying this is the reality, but this is what we have from paleontology. This is what we understand from radiology dating, carbon dating, and other datings. This is what we understand. So this evidence is coming on the cycles of this nature. So when we say that uh, this is a Treta Yuga, Satya Yuga was this time frame, Treta Yuga for so many million years, Dwapara for so many years, Kali Yuga for so many years, 
at the present time, I have a little difficult, difficulty in reconciling what I'm seeing in evidence and what I'm seeing here. That does not mean I'm rejecting it. The reason why I'm saying that is perhaps there is also a philosophical angle to this. And what is a philosophical angle? The ancient Indians looked at human lifetime as purusharthas, that uh, you are born at a certain time, then you go through a certain uh, period of acquiring knowledge, then you enjoy your life as a householder, then you renounce and go into uh, uh, seeking uh, knowledge. So ancient Indians saw this kind of a cycle in terms of your wants, your goals, your aspirations, and so on. So I'd like to think that many of us are like that. Maybe when we are much younger, when we have knowledge but not enough money, we want to make money out there. And after you have made enough money, that motivation is gone. Then you are perhaps more into what is the meaning of life? Why do I live? What my existence? You're going to more dharmic kind of entities and uh, understandings. I just gave that as an example. It's not the only path to that. So as an example, so we are seeing time and again that your path to dharma is preceded necessarily by a period of loosely adharma, loosely adharma, where you're doing all kinds of things and uh, pleasures and that and this, seeking to make money and whatnot. And then maybe you're going to dharma after that. Maybe after a period of dharma, you'll again lapse into adharma. We see that in multi-generational things. For example, we're seeing in one generation, if somebody is a great Vedic pundit, scholar and so on, the chances are, his children might have had a deprived existence, some of them lucky enough and good uh, karma, so they might follow that path, whereas some of them might say, I want the better life, and they're out of there and getting something else. So we are seeing that even in multi-generational lifetimes, we're seeing cycles over here that one is devoted to dharmic pursuits, other ones devoted to very worldly pursuits, once again, dharmic, worldly. So philosophically, we are seeing cycles in our aspirations, in the psychological behavior of individuals as well as communities, even entire communities. For example, looking at Western civilizations, today you might think, were these people like this all the time? No, they were savages. Just about 50 years ago, 100 years ago, with world wars and slavery and all this nonsense, they were savages, but today positioned as if they very, very human and understanding and uh, all these wokeness that you talked about, all these women talked about. they don't stop being savages. I mean, look at their interventions globally, right. what they did in Vietnam, what they did in right. uh, just recently, Afghanistan, reduced yes. it to Stone Age uh, intervention, and right. the entire Middle East, I mean, just right. oil hunger, look what is, this has driven them. So Very this predatory civilization, it can't even be shamed. The Very amazing true. thing is, and I think the Marxists and the leftists get it from this, mm -hmm. which is uh, you create lies around your existence um, and then keep peddling it with vigor. Uh, basically, it's all about loot and plunder. The basis of your foundational uh, basis of your civilization is loot and plunder, right. knowledge, wealth, right. this, that. But you're unashamed about it. And right. yet they're preaching the whole world, you know. Yeah, right. I mean, you're, you're, they're, they're saying that Sanskrit was brought to us from elsewhere. But how come those who brought it to us from elsewhere left no trace of it in their supposed homeland? Uh, how come there are no Sanskrit texts there? Nobody speaks anything close to that language. Or Dharmic or, aspiration. Nor Dharmic aspirations. I mean, <laughs> so they just brought it wholesale left right. nothing behind nobody right. moves like that no migrant group ever right. moves in that fashion mm -hmm. people invariably leave something behind a lot more behind than they mm -hmm. can take with them so True. amazing lies and they get away with it you know i really wish there was something like an international court of justice which took up these issues civilizational wrongs because occasionally they will take up issues of genocides but this is genocides of cultures, civilizations, and by the most barbaric means, which are continuing and which are which are so well established in their Ivy League universities, right? In their right. avant-garde centers of learning. That's what amazes right. me that you can't shame them because we have 200 years, 200 years of this kind of um, scholarship. 
quotes, inverted quotes scholarship, you have 200 years of layering upon layering upon layering that has resulted in the so-called Western identity of today, who they are as a people has been based entirely upon this uh, notion of migration of Central Asia, Aryans yeah. and uh, who they are, the genetic studies, everything is uh, co-opted to make this kind of a narrative happen. So changing that narrative, we come over here saying, here is evidence, take a look at this. And people would say, no. So the only way they can reconcile your evidence is to say, your data is corrupted. Your data is unreliable. Your texts are unreliable. What you're saying is unreliable because everything has got to conform to their way of thinking. So we are in a very strange situation that how, how much our data you accumulate and evidence you accumulate to the contrary, there is no way it will be accepted because the world over has purchased this 200 year enforced scholarship on who they are as a people. I guess uniquely it is only the Indians who are coming out there saying this is not who we are. At least a subset of Indians, I should hasten to say, were saying this is not who we are. We are something different from this. Yeah, and I think the day we acquire uh, not just knowledge of our Shastras, but also Shastra, we assert ourselves as a military power because uh, it's only that language that the West and the Islamic world understand. Um, mm. That's why they get along so well with each other. Um, you know, and now Islam is uh, ready to take over large parts of Europe. They, right. They're ready on for, for world conquest. So maybe one day they'll have to seek shelter as Sharnarthis in India. You know, the day, for example, ISIS flag is flying atop Buckingham Palace or the White House. <laughs> maybe that's when they'll realize that they that they did, did things very foul. Anyway, I think we should take some comments. There are some very interesting. Uh, I saw this one. Um, did Indians have any, who was it to ask you whether we had any sense of holidays? Like you have the Sabbath day in, in, in the Western world, thanks to Christianity and, mm. and the Jewish uh, uh framework right. of thinking so, but what about and that comes from their whole biblical right uh, right right so i think i think in, in in india it was a concept of what your dharma was for that particular uh, situation we have we have had enormous numbers of festivals like you said every shankranti every Purnami, every amavasya every so often we have got events to mark and festivals to celebrate. This gave us our sense of civilizational identity, who we are as a people, this is what we do. And civilization enjoyed many, many, many ways, whether you worship the instruments, the books you read, the instruments you use, so many ways of expressing your thanks to the cosmos. Everything was holistic. It is not a selfish enjoyment based kind of thing, but looking at your place in the cosmos, as in the cosmos, as so also in the micro. Uh, macro as in, the, as in the micro. So this kind of uh, 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 approach was there. India was largely agrarian society. And uh, uh, we also had several artisans who were doing many, many skills. And every one of them celebrated what they were doing at various points, whether it was in the humble village shandies and village festivals, all the way to civilization wide, like I showed Makra Shankranti, Pan-Indian festival over here. So we had celebrations. So perhaps this notion of holidays is redundant in the Indian context. This whole notion of God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh is redundant because we don't subscribe to that uh, thinking. No, this weekly holiday cycle doesn't operate. See, now A, we have adopted the biblical uh, holiday cycle, right. which is Saturday, Sunday, weekend. Right. Uh, but, uh, and then on top of it, we have the Sarkari calendar, Ambedkar Jayanti, Fla Jayanti, yes, the yes, Timka yes, Jayanti, yes. Gandhi yes. Jayanti, you know, yes. which means yes. nothing to people. Right. They do nothing on that day except that they just uh, lay down. Yeah, right. Or catch up with the lost sleep and they catch up mm -hmm. with their reading or whatever housework. But if you want to understand the Indian sense of holidays, you have to observe the pattern of urban to rural migration, 
no, no, uh, urban to rural visit cycles of migrant labor. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't care what the Sarkari calendar says about holidays, but come mm -hmm. holy, all of them are gone to their villages. Right. You right. won't get any labor in right. Delhi or in right. any city during right. holy. Similarly, right. during um, other several other similar festivals, uh, for uh, for example, uh, Navratri, those mm -hmm. nine days are completely devoted right. to whether right. at the time, even right. in communist right. Bengal, right. the entire government machinery would shut down and everybody from ministers to bureaucrats would be in Durga Pandas. Right. They won't be in government offices. Mm -hmm. it, it would shut down. So each one of those, Diwali, for example, it right. may be one day in the government uh, scheme of things, but if you look at how our labor moves, uh, they will go home for Diwali and have an extended Diwali, including Bhayaduj after that and whatever else. Mm -hmm. So the cycle of holidays is actually linked to the Panchang, uh, linked to these festivals. Yes. And these festivals actually not only uh, connected us to the cosmic dance, mm -hmm. each, each uh, person, mm -hmm. but more importantly, you know, acted as a glue uh, for yes for for celebrations. Now, my colleague, uh, yes, yes, uh, former colleague, Dr. Giri Deshinkar used to say, if you look at the Panchang. And how for each day, I mean, in, in rural uh, India, there would be every month of the day something or the other that you have to do right. to mark that particular day, whether it's Amavasya or it's Purnamashi yes. or it's this or it's yes. that. Yes. And special food. So there's yes. so much celebration in build. Yes. But celebration yes. of the cosmic dance. Celebration yes. of the Earth's yes. uh, cycles, yes. Prakriti cycles. Huh? Very it's true. not celebration of the kind um, which is um, mechanical, you know. I mean, yes. uh, International Women's Day celebration. I mean, it's all about rhetoric. It's, it's mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. artificially inflated, the enthusiasm that, mm -hmm. but for the government agencies and other agencies making an issue of it, nobody cares when it comes and it goes. So that's right. really, I mean, you know, I, I really wish that our Sarkari's cycle of holidays would recognize these. It does in part, but not fully, not fully. Right, right. I, I agree, I completely agree. Uh, so ours is an identity-based celebration of life which connects the science along with the festivals and our understanding of divinities and how their aspirational uh, goals for us as people, individuals, as societies, as communities. And I think that is what we're seeing in the expression of festivals. Like you eloquently said, Madhuji, there's so many festivals out there and uh, we connect with each of them and we assert our identity every time this is done. The assertion is not, um, it is not an in-your-face kind of thing. It is merely, this is who I am. That is all there is to it. This is who I am. This is how I celebrate life. I understand the science behind many of these things. So it's a reinforcement. Another... Sorry, sorry. No, please finish. It's a, it's a reinforcement. It's a reinforcement of the cycles, cosmic cycles that we see that is expressed through the panchang that talks about uh, events. The events can be many things, conjunctions, when a certain planet has come into a certain nakshatra, a conjunction over there, a transit. Uh, eclipse, uh, uh, Pournami, like I said, Amave, so many, many incidents that we understand and we mark. So each time we do a certain celebration in a certain way, there are so many things built in. Even the foods that you eat at certain festivals yes. are marked with certain ideas in mind about your holistic diet through the year, what you do yes. at various times. So there's so much to talk about the exactly. deep connection of festivals and observances. Yeah. Like Tilka gajak, you know, the, the use of sesame seeds and gourd, yes. snacks yes. made out of that. It's it's in this winter season that it comes, mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. on this day of glory and tomorrow Makar Sankranti. Right. But see, the other thing that um, strikes me is that each one of our festivals 
demands a different kind of celebration. Navratri mm-hmm. is one kind. Yes. There is austerity, you fast and you feast. Mm-hmm. And you dance and you sing. Mm-hmm. Ram Naomi requires totally different kind of celebration. Diwali, uh, similarly holy. Right, Each right, one right, right, has right. a different manner of celebration. Whereas mm-hmm. the celebration that the West has brought to our life is have a party, eat, drink, get drunk, and dance. And right. that dance is, you know, a crazy, you know, going batty kind of a dance, the kind of dance that mm-hmm. Bollywood or mm-hmm. or even these uh, uh, the Western modern style dances have brought in. It's the same dance that you will do on a birthday party, the same that you will do on a wedding party, the same mm-hmm. for a political rally. There's just no difference. And right. the, just right. these three elements. So eat, drink, play loud, glaring music and dance like you're besotted. But even our dances, you know, Navratri dance is different. What you do in Vaisakhi is a different dance altogether. They, mm-hmm. they, they very different uh, rhythms to, 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 to them. So uh, this uh, homogenization of culture right. is really cost us a lot. Now, let me see what, what other questions we have. Um, Shilpa says there's a change in our body during Amavasya and Purnima, especially women. Would you agree? Yeah, anecdotally, uh, I cannot claim to have experience here, but anecdotally, uh, we do know that, uh, the, for example, the onset of periods and other things which cause goes into synchronism and cycles along with the lunar yeah. cycles and other uh, issues. Yeah, we do have uh, um, uh, th- these things happening. So uh, there is some evidence to this, biochemical evidence to this, and one will have to study this. In addition to that, the sleep patterns, what kind of sleep patterns mm-hmm. one might have, circadian rhythms and other such things on the basis of uh, amount of uh, uh, sunshine and the amount of moon activity that there is. I guess all of these things are related. One will have to see how it relates to the synodic month. I'm glad it's the synodic month. Uh, perhaps also for the uh, nakshatra, sidereal month, there is some something to talk about there too. But yes, I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, surprised that it would, it would be the case. Now, please tell us about the significance of Brahma Mahurat. And the, and difference, the difference between Vikram Samvat and Shak Samvat. So let me take that. So the, the, the eras... So like I said, it is not enough just to mark the passage of time in a day. Passage of time in a day with a a watch, you can say, this is how the hours, seconds are going, minutes are going. And uh, with with, with water clocks, ancient Indians did with water clocks, water clocks and gnomons, which were sundials and other things. They could measure the passage of time during the day. In addition to that, you need to know the passage of time in the week. That was a weekday. Addition to that, passage of time over months to measure seasons and other such things. You had the lunar month, you had the solar month. We talked about those things. Addition to that, you want to talk about your age. So you're going to have some marker and say from that point, the time I was born and this time, this is my age. You could do things of that nature. So if you want to mark an era itself, a civilizational memory of an event that is of significance to your civilization, that is when you got these various eras. The, and in this case, you're talking about Vikram and the Shaka, two different events that have different uh, significances. Now, how do we even start talking about the time when these eras started? So today, the, uh, we find the colonial people had got several epigraphy records in various temples that might have referenced to Vikram Samvat or Shaka Samvat or others. And they try to say, this is the time frame. However, like I said, uh, Vedvir Arya has done a lot of work in this area, studying the epigraphy and try to see that there is a difference in the chronological calendars, a difference of 660 years. I think that is what he has found. There are uh, Most of our chronology must be adjusted because of the errors. Whenever the British misidentified the era, they discarded some of the epigraphy as spurious or as forgeries and things like that. And Vedavid did a brilliant thing. He just studied all the so-called forgeries and said, no, these can all be reconciled if you understand that there are two calendar systems here, the Shaka and the Shalivahana. These are two different things. You understand these things, Shakanta and Shaka. You can understand that there are two calendrical systems and uh, you can reconcile that. On the basis of that, he's written his book, Chronology of Ancient India. 
So the difference comes in the observation of these two events, when they happened and so on. For details, please refer to uh, Vedavir's work. You'll find a lot of information over there on, uh, on no, when it, these eras actually happened. Brahma Mahurat Badayana. So uh, the significance of Brahma Muhurta. So like I said, Muhurta is an indicator of uh, the, 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 the time. So we have a unit which is 48 minutes. The day was divided into, um, into uh, 30 segments. And each segment is about 48 minutes. Each is a Muhurta. And uh, we start our day with sunrise. So Brahma Murta comes significance over there, the starting at sunrise time. Like I said, a if little you take, before sunrise, right? Yes, 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 yes. Brahma take, Murta is a bit before dawn, sunrise. Dawn, dawn, before that, the dawn time, before that. Hmm. So if you look at if you look at other cultures like Babylon and others, they measure at sunset time. And we are measuring marking time at sunrise time. So we have got various names and nomenclature for each of these Mahurtas that help us to identify and do our activities with that. No, but I, you know, the significance of getting up in the morning at Brahma Mahurat, uh, whoever has asked me this question, asked us this question, please go back to yesterday's uh, discussion with Professor Subhash Kak. He gave a very interesting account of how uh, Lo uh, Lord Hanuman who is supposed to be Gyanagun Sagar in search of knowledge, uh, he goes to his guru and says, I want knowledge. And, and what the guru tells him about going to the sun, Surya Dev Ke Paas Jao, he is the repository of, of all knowledge. And he goes to Surya Dev and Surya Dev says, but how can I teach you um, the Gyan that you're seeking? Because I'm moving constantly. And Hanumanji says, okay, then I will move ahead of you, but, you know, uh, moving backward, which is to say, I, which is to say, you seek Gyan, be ahead of Surya. Don't mm -hmm. sleep when the sun is rising and uh, don't wake up, you know, which is what the modern life is all about. Uh, I, I ruined my health. Beautiful. That's a beautiful, way. beautiful way. Beautiful ah, way of saying it. Beautiful story. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that's the time your mind is uh, also um, the cosmic rays, the way they function, the forces at that time, which is why people who meditate invariably get up and do it at that hour. Right. Apparently, the forces that facilitate um, heightened consciousness. Absolutely. New. Absolutely. Absolutely. So biochemically also we know the neuronal activity after deep sleep, after REM sleep, after various sleeps, the alpha waves and other such things. We, we are aware that at waking up time at a certain point in time when there's not much stimuli, you're, you can focus your neuronal activity to uh, great things, study or other other such things. Maybe once you have a lot of sunlight around you, stimuli is great and your attention is pulled into various things. There could be various uh, understandings of this. At least so your very health is really good. Say. You get up with, before sunrise and you sleep early, you at least ensure a healthy life. And, mm -hmm. and a healthy body invariably uh, houses a healthy mind. Absolutely, you know? yes, yes, a yes. Healthy body. And I learned it at great cost. Unfortunately, all those of us who go to hostels, you know, completely get ruined in terms of our, uh, and then this romance of studying all night, <laughs> um, working all night, it's been one of the big disastrous uh, habits of my life. And I'm trying now to fix it, to tune myself to, Brahma Mahurat and makes a lot of difference. Yes. You know, your productivity level. Uh, my mother used to say, in fact, that mm -hmm. if you wake up at Brahma Mahurat, then you, in that period, you do three, four times more work than you will do in the rest of the day. And if you mm -hmm. get up late, she says, you, she, her, her phrase used to be, you're forever chasing time because you're mm -hmm. running behind schedules. Right. You're forever chasing time. You're right. never in tune with time. Mm -hmm. So be in tune with time, that's the time to get up. I really wish 
I had been disciplined to do it, to just let me uh, be undisciplined, mm -hmm. you know, freedom. And freedom isn't always good. A discipline oh, yeah. is very necessary. Absolutely, anyway, absolutely. Uh, Western universities have been taken over by Marxists. That's why you got professors saying whites are a yeah. I don't know what that is. Anand Mohan Karpanam to you was it? Uh, I've already answered Anand about holidays. Uh, somebody uh, said Wikipedia says uh, Rigveda no. was written. It was in there. Do you want to comment on that? So this is uh, utter nonsense. Start with Wikipedia. Wikipedia is run by a cabal, cabal of uh, academic terrorists who are intent on trying to keep their narrative over there and lock out any uh, of the not permitted narratives. If you want to use Wikipedia, I recommend use it only for sciences. If you want some scientific knowledge and other such things, history of that, not entirely history, just, just some uh, citation knowledge over there, use it, nothing else. Anyway, Wikipedia is enforcing the notion of Aryan invasion theory to uh, 1500 BC. Aryans came into India, brought Sanskrit along, and composed the Rig Vedas and others in India. Max Muller, champion of this idea, the Chandas period, Mantra period, Brahmana period, Sutra period, 1200 BC, all this nonsense has come through something called linguistic analysis. And linguistic analysis around 1800s and so on was born because William Jones had found the commonality of Sanskrit, Latin, and Greek in an effort to understand this and the relationship of the European to the Indian. Why do we have a related language? How are we related? These questions were answered in Eurocentric notions and senses with biblical ideas thrown in, biblical chronology thrown in, in the 1800s through this entirely bigoted framework of uh, 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 Aryans coming into India in uh, 1500 BC. That is a model which they propose, and that model is layered upon and used. So Wikipedia is enforcing that. NCRT also enforces that. Your children in your schools are learning this, but they had to address why do we have so many paradoxes? So many paradox. I showed one paradox where Aitreya Brahmana, Martin Hogg translation, he's saying, the Yajna went away and uh, they're saying, Aditi says, everything will begin and end with me. And beginning of a year and ending of a year at Vernal Equinox, when was that in the Indian civilization? Last, you go to planetarium software, you find 6,000 BCE. So how is a Vedic concept in place over there? Kali Yuga, we are talking about 3102 BCE. How is a Vedic concept in place in 3102 BCE, whereas it's, everything is composed in uh, 1200 or 1500 BCE? And all the itihasas and everything are composed in around 200 BC and elsewhere. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make common sense. So it's utter nonsense. Utter nonsense. And Wikipedia utter lies even about contemporary beings. I mean, my own CV at Wikipedia, they won't let me correct it. They distorted <laughs> beyond recognition. And, um, you know, uh, ever since they. Uh, Ever since my book on Modi, then of course I have to be demonized, right? right. So it has to be, uh, you have to be politically correct in order for you to get a decent CV there. It's so outrageous. They're gundagardi. This is right. intellectual gundagardi of the worst order. Right. Okay, right. so, uh, sir, what is your opinion on Sri Nalesh Oak's date for Kali Yoga? Dating of Kali Yoga. So we have got a lot of brilliant researchers today who are trying to uncover our history and we should applaud every one of them. Every one of them we should applaud because they've taken that great desire to come and see our Ritihasas. How do we interpret this, understand the astronomy, understand the math and try to come up with dates of that. So I can read off so many names myself in the current or contemporary times, but this activity has been going on at least from Balaganga Tilak at least from S.P. Dikshit, from their times when the Britishers are trying to tell something about Aritihasas, from that time, Balagangadhar Tilak, Dikshit and others were trying to say, no, 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 you have a problem. This is our understanding, internal emic understanding of our text, and this is our understanding of chronology. From that time on, Indians have been trying to battle this Western narrator. So that has been going on for the last 120, 130 years. And today we have many contemporary researchers who are trying to understand the, uh, the, the chronology that could be implied 
by the Itihasas, Ramayana and Mahabharata. So uh, uh, we have several clusters of dates for Mahabharata chronology and for Ramayana chronology. So the Kali Yuga is an anchor point for many of these things because of the narratives contained over there. It says very clearly that the narrative that Dwaraka sank after Arjuna had rescued the Yadava princesses and everybody, Dwaraka sank. That is one such thing. Second, it says that Krishna was shot in the foot by a hunter. And after that, he left and Kali Yuga started over there. We have these understandings. Then we have understandings in Suri Siddhanta, Srimad Bhagavatam and Aryabhatiya and several other epigraphical works in India, which is talking about this clustering of planets, Revati Nakshatra and other such things, 3102 BCE. So understandably, a lot of research has gone clustering the chronology of the Mahabharata around this date. And uh, 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 Dr. Vartak, P.V. Vartak, who was from Pune, so he proposed initially that some of the chronology in Mahabharata could be dated to 5500 BCE. Mm -hmm. And Nilesh has uh, uh, expanded on some of those activities over there. Only problem is then what do we do with this 3102 BCE date? Because if you move Mahabharata to that time, I had to do something with 3102 BCE. So researchers are trying to work it out. So uh, we have to be patient. We have to be patient because this is the method of research. Somebody proposes something, somebody else will come and critique it and say that this is my understanding. Perhaps your understanding is wrong. Then somebody comes back and says, no, I found something else new, perhaps use this. So this activity is currently undergoing. Unfortunately, it is playing out in social media because we emic or internal practitioners don't have journals. We don't have mechanisms, forums, workshops, seminars, papers and uh, to, to show our results and work it out academically. So all this is playing out in uh, magazine articles, in uh, blogs, in uh, social media, in videos. This is where it's playing out. And the people who are observing this are the ground. Ground. Uh, Dr. Vedam, but this is preparing the ground. This is fertilizing right. the soil, very right. barren soil, thanks to 250, 70 odd years Right. of colonial education right. uh, i think now we are perhaps uh, at least starting to raise questions the government True. still stays steadfast in promoting right. the aryan invasion theory so right. be right. it but but these days too will pass now there's uh, can you say something about the mayan calendar mayan calendar yes so the Mayans, Mayans had I, I, not not much, unfortunately. My understanding of the Mayan civilization, very ancient Central American civilization, with a calendar that uh, positioned a cycle changing, maybe in 2012, 2013 or so, that time frame, somewhere around there, the cycle changed. So the Mayans, unfortunately, like all other native people in Americas, were wiped out with the conquistadors, the, the Spanish and uh, other civilizations. So not much is known. People can't even speak the Mayan language. Very, very, very few specialists are there who are able to interpret. Much of the Ma Mayan books, their works were burnt by the Catholics who came there to Christianize these people. So we have lost a lot about their knowledge systems, but they too had great ages they too had a holistic understanding like many other older civilizations that their role is not to exploit the earth, but to live in reverence to nature. So they too mark the cycles in time, the great cycles and uh, try to see their place in it with, uh, with humility rather than with uh, the arrogance that God put us on earth to uh, rape its resources. That, that, that is not seen in Mayan. So, so we are seeing a lot of things in the Mayan that is common with Indian civilization and with uh, other old civilizations also. Let's call it Hindu civilization because Indian has really become a trap word for us because um, Indian also means um, urban nuptials. It also mm -hmm. means Kamis. It mm -hmm. also means Islamists. Right. It also means Christians. Right. who want to trash it all so right. we don't want to be indians anymore at least i know i'm tired of being uh, in i think we have to say bharatiya civilization and we'll be in bharatiya good shape civilization. Yeah. yes <laughs> indian is um, a very bastardized civilization and identity uh, identity is messed up the identity is thoroughly no, totally, messed up. totally yes now my last comment ashok kumar was here he kept on pleading didi please 
speak in Hindi, get your uh, Dr. Vedam to speak in Hindi. I cannot follow a word of this very important discussion, this important lecture. But Ishokumaji, I know you left after we failed to respond to this request. See, 90% of our lectures or more, हमारे हिंदी में ही होते हैं और जो हिंदी कम भी जानते हैं वो बड़े खुशी से सुनते हैं क्योंकि कुछ बातें जो अंग्रेजी के जानकार हैं क्योंकि राजवेदम जी तो उत्तर भारत से नहीं है आपकी मातृभाषा तेलुगु है ना राजवेदम जी लेट मी क्लेरिफाई सो सो आई आई वी स्पीक थमल एट होम and okay. i studied in karnataka so i would know kannada so i converse very efficiently in kannada and in tamil and uh, we learned hindi in uh, bangalore when i was growing up in school as a compulsory third language so i can read and write hindi i can understand bits of hindi but conversational hindi has not been um, something in my circles i never had opportunity to do that and today i've shunned bollywood movies so i don't uh, watch them to pick up hindi from there or urdu should i say from that i can't do that either so i am in an unenviable position my deep apologies that i cannot converse with you in uh, hindi but i'll be glad to talk to you in tamil or in uh, kannada fair enough fair enough it's time north indians learned some south indian languages i wish mm-hmm. our education system would encourage that i would have loved to You know, one of my grand uncles knew seventeen or nineteen Indian languages, including mm-hmm. Sanskrit. Um, he was a Rajvedya um, based in Srinagar. Now, people in those days, that generation, actually knew more languages. We become monolingual, right. practically monolingual, or we use Pidgin English and Pidgin Hindi. You know, there's mm-hmm. no roots in any language. Mm-hmm. So, you know. mass producing linguistic cripples thanks to the domination of english had it not existed i think we would have like shankaracharya ji went from down south right. from kerala all right. the way right uh, to all corners of india and he managed to communicate so well very true uh, very true so i just no i just seen baskara baskara the second was born in bijapur karnataka and he yeah. went all the way to ujjain mahakaleshwar temple and there he became a professor in the sanskrit in ujjain yeah. so we are seeing evidence in pan india movement of uh, personalities yeah. in the past because we we were grounded in uh, sanskrit prakrit and yeah. uh, other other uh, entities yeah. and if we did that even now even now if we did that made sanskrit the unifying language then culturally will be better glued emotionally will be better glued politically will be better glued um english has actually uh, created so many new divisions the worst right. being the english educated elite and those right. whose english language skills are very limited so the 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 real elite in india are not this or that caste um it's the english educated right. elite um you could you could talk nonsense gibberish um but in in oxonian accent like romila thapar and you get away with lies and uh, any any nonsense that you want to peddle so um that's a long road to travel i do hope uh the day is not far right. when our rulers will realize the importance the people are beginning to realize that mm-hmm. vedam ji i think we are living in in very interesting times this is the first time i find people are ahead of the government mm-hmm. people are ahead of their leaders right and when i say people i mean hindus mm-hmm. we've been very passive now hindus mm-hmm. are tired of being passive and they're actually making demands of the system right and mm-hmm. if this constituency grows i think our politicians will have to be more responsible and responsive to our requirements thank you very much for a very scintillating lecture and i look forward to many more discussions with you many more lectures from you um, thank you shubhratri thank you so much or jain uh, friends please do like subscribe and share and do support this channel um we do need your 
help in growing. We are very young as a channel, just about three months now. So we do seek your help and support in enhancing our outreach. Namaste, Chubratri Jain. <laughs>